the message. I didn't write it down. But, but I can tell you what it is. What's in your hand and what's in your mouth? What's in your hand and what's in your mouth? A couple of different um, foundational scriptures tonight. We're going to spend a lot of time in 1 Samuel, but we're, uh, we're going to look at a couple of just other ones just to kind of build on the title for a second. First one in Exodus 4, chapter 4, verse 2. Hey, (laughs) then the Lord asked him, what is that in your hand? A shepherd's staff, Moses replied. Now, we're not going to go through all the different things that Moses did with that shepherd's staff. But if you've read the Bible at all, or you've been in any services at all, you've heard that that staff was used a fair bit. Let's look at a couple of pages over. We're going to go to Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 11. It says, This command I am giving you today is not too difficult for you, and it is not beyond your reach. It is not kept in heaven, so distant that you must ask, Who will go to heaven and bring it down so we can hear it and obey? It is not kept beyond the sea so far away that you must ask, who will cross the sea to bring it to us so we can hear it and obey? No, the message is very close at hand. It is on your lips and in your heart so that you can obey it. Now listen, today I am giving you a choice between life and death, between prosperity and disaster, For I command you this day to love the Lord your God and to keep his commandments, his commands, decrees, and regulations by walking in his ways. If you do this, you will live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you and the land you are about to enter and occupy. Proverbs 21 23. Watch your tongue. And keep your mouth shut, and you will stay out of trouble. (laughs) Read about Samson in a different uh, in a different uh, scripture in a minute. But um, this particular verse, I kind of chuckle when I was relatively early uh, in my. born again walk with the Lord. I was in sales. I was in actually radio sales and advertising. And uh, I'm not great at sales, but I, I tried. And uh, anyway, one of, the, one of the things I came across in one of those many sales seminars and stuff that you go on as a salesman, especially a young salesman who's trying to do better than he's been doing, is you go to these things to try to get better. And I came across this little poster, and again, new Christian, right? So I felt something, there was a little bit of Bible reference, so I, 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 I hung on to it. And I actually took it and posted it on my little bulletin board in my cubicle. And it says, in one day, Samson killed, the Philistine, killed a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of an ass. Every day, a thousand sales. Are killed with the same weapon. (laughs) So I I bring that back because of this scripture. Watch your tongue and keep your mouth shut. Know when you open your mouth what it is you're going to say. Matthew 4.4. It says, but Jesus told him, No, the scripture saying, again, I'm taking just excerpts because I've got a lot of stuff as usual. (laughs) Matthew 4, 4. But Jesus told him, no, the scriptures say, people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So I think everybody in this room and probably most within the sound of my voice via the, the, the many streams will agree that the scripture is God-inspired, God-breathed. 
So every word that comes from the mouth of God is in the Bible, whether you've got the an electronic version of it with many different translations or whether you've got the hard copy, leather-bound copy, paperback copy, whatever it is that you've got on your lap. Matthew 15, 11. Words of Jesus. It's not what goes into your mouth that defiles you. You are defiled by the words that come out of your mouth. A uh, couple of uh, pages back, Matthew 12, 37. The words you say will either acquit you or condemn you. Matthew 21, 21. Then Jesus told them, I tell you the truth. If you have faith and don't doubt, you can do things like this and much more. You can even say to this mountain, may you be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and it will happen. Go back into the Old Testament for a minute. Let's go into Numbers 14.28. Now tell them this, as surely as I live, declares the Lord, I will do to you the very things I heard you say. <laughs> Gulp. <laughs> Mark eleven twenty three. Again, similar version to what we just read. Mark eleven twenty three. I tell you the truth. You can say to this mountain, may you be lifted up and thrown into the sea and it will happen. But you must really believe it will happen and have no doubt in your heart. And then the last in this group of scriptures, Luke 17, 6. The Lord answered, If you had faith, even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, May you be uprooted and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. So, again, sometimes you wonder when a message like this comes into your heart, who it is you're speaking to. I'm thinking, you guys know this. And we know the importance of our confession and our declarations and our, and our speech. But there's a lot of things going on in the world around us, in the congregation in the midst of us, in our own families. There's a lot of challenges Ashton was talking about those that are pressing in. You can feel a change. There's, there is a shift that's happening. There is something that's going on. And we need, to, we need to be fully and properly prepared. So I'm going to read, I'm going to spend a fair bit of time on it, Lord willing, and we'll keep an eye on the time. But um, it, I think it's, it's important. Um, The Lord will help us through it. 1 Samuel 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17. And of course, it's the passage of Scripture talking about Goliath. Now, Goliath is challenging the Israelites. Now, bear in mind that this is not the first encounter Israel has had with the Philistines. So this is not their first time together. There have been wars and battles fought already by the time this passage of Scripture occurs. So we'll pick it up in verse 1, and I'll read as fast as I can, and you can listen as fast as you can, and we'll try to get through this, but I don't want to rush it either. The Philistines now mustered their army for battle and camped between Succo and Judah and Azekah at Ephes Damon. Saul countered by gathering the Israelite troops near the valley of Elah. So the Philistines and Israelites faced each other on opposite hills with the valley between them. Then Goliath, a Philistine champion from Gath, came out of the Philistine ranks to face the forces of Israel. He was over nine feet tall. He wore a bronze helmet and his bronze coat of mail weighed 125 pounds. 
He also wore bronze leg armor, and he carried a bronze javelin on his shoulder. The shaft of his spear was as heavy and thick as a weaver's beam, tipped with an iron spearhead that weighed 15 pounds. His armor bearer walked ahead of him carrying a shield. So we're talking about a fairly significant and imposing fella. I think there's uh, different parts of the uh, scripture, I think, that even mentions the fact that they may have had uh, uh, six fingers and six toes on each hand. Nine feet tall. A 15-pound sp spearhead on a spear. Right? Uh, I know any, any handyman around would, would know, like, uh, holding a, a paint roller with, a, uh, with an extension handle. And how awkward, right, that can be. A paint roller, even loaded with paint, does not weigh 15 pounds. And the paint stick is not as big or as heavy as a weaver's beam. So, you know, just try to create an image here and some perspective. So Goliath, verse 8, Goliath stood and shouted a taunt across the Israelites. Why are you all coming out to fight, he called. I am the Philistine champion, but you are only the servants of Saul. Choose one man to come down here and fight me. If he kills me, then we'll be your slaves. But if I kill him, you will be our slaves. I defy the armies of Israel today. Send a man who will fight me. When Saul and Israel, Israelites heard this, they were terrified and deeply shaken. Verse 12. Now, David was the son of a man named Jesse, and if, if, <laughs> he is that, from Bethlehem in the land of Judah. Jesse was an old man at the time, and he had eight sons. Jesse's three oldest sons, Eliab, Abinadab, and Shimei, had already joined Saul's army to fight the Philistines. David was the youngest son. David's three oldest brothers stayed with Saul's army, but David went back and forth so he could help his father with the sheep in Bethlehem. For 40 days, for 40 days, think on this for a minute, not a day, not a week, not a month, 40 days, the same number of days it rained day and night, in fact, well remember, 40 days every morning and evening. So twice a day, the Philistine champion strutted in front of the Israelite army. One day, Jesse said to David, take this basket and roasted grain and these 10 loaves of bread and carry them quickly to your brothers and give these 10 cuts of cheese to their captain. See how your brothers are getting along and bring back a report on how they are doing. David's brothers were with Saul and the Israelite army at the Valley of Elah fighting against the Philistines. Well, they had been fighting against the Philistines. Right now, they're parked on the other side of the valley not fighting the Philistines. Important distinction here right now. And again, I'm going somewhere with this, so bear with me. So David left the sheep with another shepherd and sent out early the next morning with the gifts as Jesse had directed him. He arrived at the camp just as the Israelite army was leaving for the battlefield with shouts and battle cries. Shouts and battle cries. So these guys are serious. Now again, remember, this is not their first military campaign against the Philistines. But this has been going on for 40 days and 40 nights of them not fighting, right? But they're still going through the motions, shall we say. He arrived at the camp just as the Israelite army was leaving for battlefield with shouts and battle cries. Soon the Israelite and Philistine forces stood facing each other, army against army. David left his things with the keeper of supplies and hurried out to the ranks to greet his brothers. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, came out from the Philistine ranks, and David heard him shout his usual taunt to the army of Israel. Now, I'm stressing the word taunt because we're going to get into this in a minute. 
As soon as the Israelite army saw him, they began to run away in fright. Have you seen the giant? The men asked. He comes out each day to defy Israel. The king has offered a huge reward to anyone who kills him. He will give the man one of his daughters for a wife, and the man's entire family will be exempted from paying taxes. It was probably a big deal then. It's an even bigger deal now. <laughs> David asks the soldier standing nearby, what will a man get for killing the Philistine and ending the defiance of Israel? Who is this pagan Philistine anyway, that he is allowed to defy the armies of the living God? And these men gave David the same reply. They said, yes, that is the reward for killing him. But when David's oldest brother Eliab heard David talking to the man, he was angry. What are you doing around here anyway, he demanded. What about those few sheep you were supposed to be taking care of? I know your pride and deceit. You just want to see the battle. What have I done now? David said. I was only asking a question. He walked over to some others and asked the same thing and received the same answer. Then David's question was reported to King Saul, and the king sent for him. Don't worry about this Philistine, David told Saul. David told Saul, I'll go fight him. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy, and he's been a man of war since his youth. But David persisted. I've been taking care of my father's sheep and goats, he said. When a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. I have done this both to lions and bears. I always thought it was lion and bear. Right? There's S's at the end of that. It means this happened more than once. And I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too, for he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. Saul finally consented. All right, go ahead, he said, and may the Lord be with you. Then Saul gave him his own armor. Now, remember, Saul's in this group as well. Saul is the king. Saul is also head and shoulders above his peers. So he's no Minnie Mouse either. He's a big man. He's a warrior. And he's been on the sidelines cowering behind the rocks too. Now he's given this young fella... His trying to give him his armor. Again, you got to, you got to picture it, right? And again, I'm going somewhere. Bear with me. Then Saul gave David his own armor, a bronze helmet and a coat of mail. David put it on, strapped the sword over it, and took a step or two to see what it was like, for he had never worn such things before. <laughs> I can't go in these, he protested to Saul. I'm not used to them. So David took them off again. He picked up five smooth stones from the stream and put them into his shepherd's bag. Then armed only with his shepherd's staff and sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistines. Goliath walked out toward David and with his shield bearer ahead of him, sneering in contempt at this ruddy-faced boy, Am I a dog, he roared at David, that you come at me with a stick? And he cursed David by the names of his gods. Come over here and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals, Goliath yelled. David replied to the Philistine, you come to me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Today, the Lord will conquer you, and I will kill you and cut off your head. And then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel." And everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people, but not with sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle, and he will give you to us. As Goliath moved closer to attack, David quickly ran out to meet him. He's not hiding behind the rocks. 
Reaching into his shepherd's bag and taking out a stone, he hurled it with his sling and hit the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank in, and Goliath stumbled and fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over all the Philistines with only a sling and a stone, for he had no sword. Then David ran over, pulled Goliath's sword from the sheath. David used it to kill him and cut off his head. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they turned and ran. Then the men of Israel and Judah, the men of Israel and Judah gave a great shout of triumph. <laughs> now they're all brave, and rushed after the Philistines, chasing them as far as Gath and the gates of Ekron. The bodies of the dead and wounded Philistines were strewn all along the road from Sharim as far as Gath and Ekron. Then the Philistine army returned and plundered the deserted Philistine camp. David took the Philistine's head to Jerusalem, but he stored the man's armor in his own tent. Now, I know that was a lot of scripture. I know that was a lot of verse. Thank you for indulging me to read. But you'll understand why, I think, now. The giant, for 40 days, morning and night, was taunting and jeering the Israelites. What are the voices of the circumstances of your life saying to you? I can tell you with relative certainty, if they're talking, it is more likely taunting than encouraging. They're more likely discouraging than encouraging. And they're more likely to be trying to tear you down than build you up. Talk about the voices of the circumstances and the situations around you. Life is happening all around us. There's some challenges. People are facing some significant challenges. Challenges with their mental health, challenges with their physical health, challenges with their financial health, challenges with their peers, challenges with their families. There's stuff going on. What's it telling you? But my question is, what are you telling it? What do you do when you hear those voices? Do you listen in silence and compliance? For 40 days, Israel listened to this big giant and didn't do anything about it. They might all be scratching their heads saying, what are we going to do? If we go to fight him and we lose, we're going to be slaves. And that had to be the conversation. Otherwise, they would have gone to fight him. And they would have beat him. And it wouldn't have gone on for 40 days, right? The, nobody had, before David came along, nobody showed up to fight. They were all there to fight. But nobody was fighting. Nobody dared stand up against a giant. Some of the verses I read earlier talked about speaking to the mountain. Say to this mountain. It didn't say grab a shovel. It's important. I've had the shovel in hand. Doesn't work. <laughs> Yeah, one shovel at a time, yes, but it takes a long time to move out. And there's some of the obstacles that we face that need divine intervention. So do you listen to the voice and listen complacently? Well, how often do we take what we are told? Goliath is saying to the children of Israel, you're only the servants of Saul. I'm the champion of Gath. Now, I'm not talking specifically about what people are telling us. I'm talking about the issues of life. When you wake up in the morning and your body is telling you a different story than I am healed, what are you saying? When you open up your bank app or your checkbook, and it's telling you a different story than I have more than enough.
When you're going through some mental challenges, stress, anxiety, depression, what are you saying? What are you hearing? What are you paying attention to? Now, throw into the mix people around us who are more than happy to jump on the bandwagon and spread the misery, telling you how bad it is, telling you about the cost of gas, telling you about the cost of food, telling you about the economy, telling you about our beloved government. And we have a whole cacophony of things telling us things we do not want or need to hear. And yet, the voice continues. The taunt from across the valley keeps coming loud and clear. What is it we're listening to? Everything we put in to our mind and our spirit our soul is diluting something. So what is diluting what? Is the circumstances of our life diluting the truth of the Word of God that's in us? Or is the truth of the Word of God diluting the truth of the circumstances that we're facing? I don't know if you're able to get in on this, Christopher. Hopefully I'm visible. I can't, I can't tell. So. so these, you can hear these. These have substance, right? Sound like dice, but they're marbles, glass. If I was to throw one of these, right, you would feel it, right? You hear that, right? So these are the voices of our life, right? Again, not necessarily the voices of people. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, right? But these are the voices of the things knocking on our mind, knocking on our soul. This is sand. You can't probably even see it from where you're standing. Very, very fine. And this particular stuff is very fine sand. This represents the Word. This represents the truth of God that's in our hearts, that's in our life, that's in our being. When we're full, there's very little room for those things of life to get in. But what if we're more full of the circumstances? What if we're more full of the aches and the pains? What if we're more full of the disease? What if we're more full of the complaints, the murmuring, the frustration, the strife, the aggravation, the emotional torment. Just because it's full doesn't mean that we're without hope. See, we're never too late to start applying the Word. Right? Never too late to start applying the Word, to begin walking the truth of the Word, to begin speaking the truth of the Word, to begin applying the truth of the Word. See, it's getting in there. It's starting to get in and around all those things that are trying to raise itself against us. Now, I can't do it here just because I'll make a real mess. But if I was to continue pouring and shaking, you know what's going to start happening? I remember, I remember this illustration that, that uh, 
Pastor um, Wallace Smith Sr. preached at our, at our service one, one Sunday at 110 Thorn. And he talked about a donkey, donkey that fell in a pit. And he was being, they were, they were shoveling dirt into the pit. And the donkey was in the foot of the pit. But the shovel full of dirt would land on the donkey. And the donkey would shake it off. Another shovel of dirt and on the donkey. Donkey would shake it off. Shovelful after shovelful after shovelful. The donkey would shake it off. Before long, the hole was full, and the donkey was standing on top of the pile. Same thing. We may be shaken, right? We may be stirred, <laughs> right? We may be agitated. But what will happen is eventually the word will start to push out the distractions, the frustrations, the aggravations, the pain, the, 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 the pains. That's the truth that we need to walk in. It may be a basic, simple message, but there are people all around us that are going through it. We need to keep lifting them in prayer, and we need to be speaking the solution to the issues, not the problem. Not the problem. Saying, you all look miserable today, <laughs> is not doing anything to make anybody feel any better. Now you say, what a fine, happy, handsome bunch and beautiful bunch of people I'm looking at today. You know what happens? Everybody puts a smile on their face. What's in your hand? What's in your mouth? See, Goliath knew who he was, but so did David. Do you know who you are? We, we will often tacitly acknowledge, yes, we're a child of the Most High God. But do you realize the covenant that we have? The power that we have? that we can so easily leave as we're standing or hiding behind the rock as the stuff around us is taunting us, leveling accusations against us, challenging our faith. Did God really say? How do you answer it? And we need to do what God says to do. When David hurled that, that sling and the stone, it was with God's power and God's anointing. When Moses raised that, raised that staff and either hit the rock and the water gushed out or held it over the Red Sea and it parted, God's power, God's anointing. When Samson slew a thousand Philistines with the physical jawbone of an ass, he did so under God's anointing. We walk in God's anointing. We walk with the covenant power of a covenant-keeping God. Our mission, <laughs> should we choose to accept it, is to declare God's goodness, to speak God's goodness, to speak the word, to show up to the battle and fight. Say, who are you? I'm a child of the Most High God. Every name, everything that has a name is subject to the name of Jesus. And cancer is no different. Heart conditions are no different. Allergies are no different. Shingles are no different. 
viruses, diseases of all kinds, they all got a name. Anxiety, fear, depression, financial challenges. If you can name it, it's subject to the name of Jesus. We need to walk in that power. That's where I'm going to have to park it. Walk and talk in the power. Speak the word. Walk in the truth. And whatever it is that God has put in your hand, whether it's the testimony, whether it's the physical word, whether it's your tools or your talents, use it to God's glory. Follow his leading, because he will lead us. There's a whole world out there that's lost. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. We hope this message has encouraged you in your relationship with the Lord. For more information and ministry resources, we invite you to visit our website at www.newcovenantchurch.ca. We look forward to you joining us next time as we continue to live victoriously.